We are looking at the book of Acts. Uh, we're still in chapter 6, but we will get into chapter 7 this morning as well. Uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, uh, what a privilege it is to come before you, uh, to worship you, to lift your name on high. Lord, we acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing. Uh, we can do all things through you, Jesus, who strengthen us. Uh, we pray for your strength, your wisdom, your discernment, your uh, power to be upon our lives as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the weakness of our flesh. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this amazing example in the life of uh, Stephen, and we pray, Lord, that we would glean the things that you have for us as individuals, as a body of believers, as we look at this uh, powerful section of Scripture here in the book of Acts. So we commit our ways to you, uh, pray that you be lifted up and glorified in all that we say and do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's turn to Acts chapter 6. Uh, how many of you were at the baptism last week? Raise your hand. A number of you were there. Awesome. That was good. We had a great time. I think we baptized like 13 or 14 people, and it was a special, special day. So anyway, we left off in Acts chapter 6. We got to verse 8. Uh, that's where we were introduced to this man named Stephen. Uh, he was one of the seven who were chosen. Uh, he'd be one of the original deacons, you might say. He was a table waiter waiting on uh, the widows and the orphans, the widows with their children, uh, taking care of practical needs of the people there. And uh, we saw that they were to have uh, three different um, qualifications. Uh, it says that they were to be to have a good reputation. Uh, it means they need to have a consistent walk, not only around Christians, but out in the world. Uh, that's, the, that's having a good reputation. Secondly, it says in verse 3 that the Lord's servants should be full of the Holy Spirit. In other words, as they serve the body of Christ, they should be filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in God's love, uh, serving with joy, having peace in their hearts, just the fruit of the Spirit being produced in their lives. And then we saw the third thing was that they needed to be men of wisdom, in other words, people who consistently make wise choices, uh, people who choose God's ways on a consistent basis and not the ways of this sinful, fallen world. So Stephen was one of the, the men that was sold out to Jesus. Uh, he um, took great pleasure in serving the body of Christ here in Jerusalem. So let's look at chapter 6, uh, verse 8 once again. It says, And Stephen, full of faith, and power did great wonders and signs among the people. And so here's this man who is full of faith and power, uh, again, because he is full of the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. And as a result, it says here, God used him in tremendous ways. He's a beautiful example of how God will use someone who is simply being faithful in the little things. And when you're faithful in the little things, God can in bring the increase. He can do greater things through your life. But you got to start off saying, here I am, Lord, use me, whatever he's calling you to do, and not think that, oh, I'm not going to do anything for God until there's 5,000 people, you know, wanting to hear what I have to say. No, you, you'd be faithful in the little things. Um, in his commentary on the book of Acts, H.A. Ironside, some of you remember him or heard of him, uh, he says of this situation with Stephen. This is the first time we read of any members of the church other than the apostles doing miracles. Now God put his hand on Stephen and he used him to perform miracles and wonders. If you are faithful in a little place, God will have a much larger place for you. If you are faithful in things that are small, he will put you in a place over things that are large. People want to do such big things, but they are not willing to do the little things. Uh, again, as we see with Stephen here, he had been faithful, he had been true, uh, serving the tables. And so God now tells him, I want to take you out there and do greater things with your life and through your life. And God did great things through his life as he does, it says, uh, great signs and wonders among the people. Um, you know, there are those known as cessationists. They think, well, once the apostles died out, then there were no more miraculous things that took place. I disagree with that, and here's the reason why. Right here with Stephen, I mean, he was a deacon. He was not a, an apostle, never was an apostle, and yet God did tremendous things through him, and we'll see he does tremendous things through Philip later on. And so God will use anybody that is open to doing what God wants to do. Um, once again, when God raises someone up, 
and uh, is using them in powerful ways, you can make sure that the enemy is going to come along and, and Satan is going to try to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he loves to do. And so look at this here in verse 9. He stirs up problems. There, then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. And so it mentions where they're from, Cyrenians, Alexandrians. So that's northern Africa. Those from Cilicia and Asia, that's way north of Israel. And they were disputing with Stephen. Now Stephen takes up the rest of chapter 6, all of chapter 7, and so why was this deacon given so much airtime in the Bible? For a couple of important reasons. Number one is he becomes the very first one to die for his faith and trust in Jesus. He's the first martyr. Uh, secondly, he has a tremendous testimony, and there'll be a person there that watches him get stoned to death. He'll be approving of him being stoned to death, and that's Saul of Tarsus. And Saul will hear these words that Stephen's going to preach, and he is going to be convicted in his heart later on, and he will get you know, saved in chapter 9, and we know him as Paul the Apostle. And so for a couple reasons, that's why Stephen's message here is so vital. And so over the course of time, he would be convicted, and we'll see that Paul will use Stephen's message here as an outline for some of his messages as well. Now, Stephen was probably ministering in the synagogue. It's made up of, it says, the freedmen. These are probably people that were scattered from Israel. They were um, in bondage in certain areas in the Roman Empire. And so they leave, they come back to Jerusalem, and then they just get together. You know, birds of a feather flock together, so to speak. And so these Jews from different areas, they're part of the synagogue. They call it the synagogue of the freedmen. Now, again, as Stephen shared the good news of, of Christ with them, it quickly becomes apparent that he is in a lion's den. Uh, they don't like what he has to say, and so he's going to be confronted by a group of hostile people. They're going to drag him before uh, the leaders of Israel. So look at verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now, you know, he's just speaking the truth of God's word, and they couldn't resist. And yet they're mad at him. You know, you probably dealt with people like that. You share the good news of Christ with them, and they get upset. And it's like, this is good news. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you all your sins. And they still get mad. Oh, you're calling me a sinner, huh? Well, we're all sinners. That's why Jesus came, to die for our sins. But this is exactly what Jesus said would happen uh, to his disciples. This is in Luke chapter 12. Look at these verses, verses 11 and 12. It says, now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And we'll see how faithful Jesus was to Stephen. That's exactly what you know, it says Stephen is doing here. Uh, he's, they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And so... Those words of Jesus ring true in his life. Now, the one thing we do know about Stephen is that he knew the scriptures as well as anyone. I mean, this guy knew his Bible, Genesis to Malachi. He knew the Old Testament scriptures. And I love the fact that the Lord used a simple man of God who knew the word of God to prove to the people that Jesus is the son of God. And that's exactly what he will do. Now, I believe that being an effective witness for Christ will only grow in proportion to our understanding of God's Word. If any of us wants to be an effective witness for Christ, then we need to be armed and equipped with the Word of God. And this man, Stephen, knew the Word of God. He believed the Word of God. He was already a martyr for Christ before he dies. He's already a martyr for Christ. Remember, the word martyr comes from the word martis, which Jesus uses to say witness. And so if you're a living witness for Jesus, you're a living martyr for Jesus. Uh, we get that from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is what Jesus told them. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we see that here with Stephen. And you shall be witnesses. That word is martis, where we get the word martyr. You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so the best witness for Jesus is somebody who has already died to self. 
That's what it means. We are need to be dead to ourselves, alive in Christ. We've been crucified with Christ. We've been raised up together with Christ. And so we die to self. And then you become a living testimony of the living, risen Savior, Jesus. Uh, Jesus tells the persecuted church there in uh, Smyrna, in Revelation chapter 2, he says, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. And so they were willing to die. They were ready to die. They were already dead to themselves, and so that's what we see here with Stephen. And here's this deacon who would become the first faithful martyr for Christ. Now, the fact is, he didn't serve the Lord because, oh, this would be a fun thing to do. Uh, he didn't serve the Lord because he thought this is a cool thing to do. He served the Lord because he loved Jesus with all of his heart, and he was surrendered to the Lord. And he wanted others to know Jesus Christ is the only way. He's the only uh, source of salvation. Jesus alone died on the cross for your sins, for my sins. He shed his blood. He redeemed us with his blood so that we could be forgiven. We could be saved. We could have eternal life. And that's the whole purpose of what you know it means to be sold out to Christ. And as we'll see, the glory of God came upon him, and the word of God came out of him, and God used him in powerful ways. Now, would to God that all of us in here would be filled with the Holy Spirit and that we'd be filled with power, we'd be filled with wisdom as well to be a living testimony of the risen Savior. So verse 11, this should sound familiar. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. I mean, that's exactly what they did with Jesus. They bring in these false witnesses. They testify false things against Jesus. Oh, we heard him say he's going to destroy the temple in three days. He's going to rebuild it. It's like, he didn't say that. He said he was going to, you know, rise from the dead is what he's referring to after three days. And they bring in false witnesses. They try to make him look bad. And so in verse 12, it says, and they stirred up the people the elders, this is the Jewish leaders, and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. So this would be the Sanhedrin. Uh, they also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. So they go from the synagogue over to where the Temple Mount is. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, it could be that Stephen was talking about the second coming of Christ, that when the Lord returns, he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. He's going to destroy the enemies of Israel. He's going to establish his kingdom, his throne there in Jerusalem. He may have been quoting from Isaiah and Daniel and Zechariah, the other prophets, about how the Messiah would come and he would set up his glorious kingdom as he defeats all the enemies. So whatever he said, they twist it, and they make him sound like he's just a weirdo. He's a Jesus freak. He's just out of his mind. But this just shows us that Stephen was exactly where he was supposed to be. Uh, he was a light shining bright in this room of darkness. And these guys were all in darkness. They don't know Jesus as their Messiah. They were three months earlier saying, crucify him, crucify him. But like Stephen... Don't be afraid, because Jesus is right there with you every step of the way. Uh, Paul reminds Timothy, his timid friend, his son in the faith, in 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that's exactly where we find Stephen. He is not fearful. He will preach the gospel. He will give them a history lesson here as well. Look at verse 15. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as a face of an angel. I mean, the Holy Spirit has come upon Stephen in such a beautiful and wonderful way here. It says his face is glowing. Uh, he's radiating with the love of Jesus. Now, it's interesting that um, they're accusing him of blaspheming Moses. And you remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face was glowing, and they had to put a bag over his head because the glowing was dissipating. But here we see him glowing in their presence. He wasn't speaking against Moses. He's acting just like Moses here. And so it's almost like God is saying to the crowd, this man is not against Moses. He's not against the law. He's just like Moses. He is my faithful servant. 
And yet, once again, these religious authorities, they're blinded by their own pride. They're blinded by their own arrogance. They can't see, you know, what God is doing through, through Stephen here. They can't see it. They got blinders on. So chapter 7, verse 1, starts off saying, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Now, we're not sure which high priest that is because they had Annas and then they also had Caiaphas. They were both called the high priest at that time. Caiaphas was Annas' son-in-law. But either way, it's the high priest here says, Are these things so? You know, it's kind of interesting here because Stephen saw this as an open door to preach the gospel. And again, the rest of this chapter is many, this is the longest sermon in the New Testament that Stephen will preach. And what he will do is give these religious authorities a powerful review, uh, a very accurate history lesson on how God established the Jews as a people how God brought them into the promised land of Israel. And yet, through it all, the people continued to rebel against God. They continued to harden their hearts against the word of God. They would stone the prophets of God and so forth. And he will tie it all together by showing that Jesus Christ came as the final prophet. He came as the ultimate deliverer. He came as the promised Messiah. And Jesus came not to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. And the only reason you and I are righteous today is because we are in Christ, and He fulfilled the law perfectly. He said, I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it, and He did. And so now the law is fulfilled in us because we are in Christ. So don't think, well, i got to try harder, i got to do all these things to keep the law. No, the law is written in our hearts, and we're in Christ. So we are declared righteous by God because we are in Jesus. Not by anything we can do, not by any good work we can do, but by the good work of Jesus when he died in our place. He shed his blood for our sins. And so listen in as Stephen addresses his accusers here. And once again, notice how the scriptures just come pouring out of his heart. Verse 2, And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And so Stephen opens his message by going all the way back to Abraham. And they all regarded Abraham as the father of faith, the Jewish faith. And this is nothing but the grace of God that we see here with Abraham's life. Because in God's sovereign will, he picks Abraham. Who is Abraham? He was Abram from Chaldea. Here it talks about from the Mesopotamia area. Ur of the Chaldeans is where he lived. It was just a pagan place. Nobody knew the one true God then. And so God sovereignly says, I want you to leave, bring your wife with you, Sarai, and I'm going to take you into the promised land. And so this is God just working and just doing amazing work here. He knew from eternity past how he was going to do this. And in obedience to God, the one true living God, because they believed in multitudes of gods back then. None of them were real. And so the one true living God says, okay, come on out here. I'm going to show you the land I'm going to give you. And we're told in Genesis 15, the only reason that Abraham was called righteous is because he believed God's word. He put his faith and trust in the Lord. And again, that's true today. The only way any of you are saved is because you put your faith and trust in Jesus. You heard the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to us Greeks, us Gentiles. And so when you put your faith and trust in him alone, he saves you. It's not any good work you can do. Abraham didn't do any good works. He simply believed God's word. He obeyed God's word. And God pulls him out of his pagan land, and he's going to bring him into the promised land. Now, what has God declared? That Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Again, only through the blood of Christ can we have our sins washed away. It's only by receiving Jesus into our hearts that we can become born again by the Spirit of God. And then we have that promise that he's going to prepare a place for us in glory. And so Stephen is going to go through this history lesson uh, of the nation of Israel. He will show them that their faith in God is what God desires, not just trying to keep a bunch of rules, rituals, and regulations. And, and that's where they're putting their hope, their faith in their own good works. And Stephen's going to say, no, it's all about Jesus. 
But this is why Abraham is called the father of faith. He had a lot of things to believe God for. He had to believe that God would take care of him. He had to believe that God would take care of his wife. Uh, they would leave their homeland. They would travel to the west out into a place of desolation they knew nothing about. And I'm sure most of his relatives, maybe you experienced this with some of your relatives when you gave your life to Christ, they thought you were crazy. You know, who's telling you to leave? You know, who's telling you to go out into this you know, foreign land? Where does this God want you to live? How, how are you going to make it? You got a job lined up? You have insurance? <laughs> no, we're just going to trust the Lord. And that's exciting. That's one of the exciting things about God is as we put our faith and trust in Him, as we walk in obedience to His Word, we begin to see His hand opening up doors. We begin to see His hand leading us and guiding us and, and giving us opportunities to serve Him. Now, Abraham was far from perfect in his faith. So he's the father of the Jewish faith, but he's not perfect. He stumbled. He bumbled along. He would lie saying, Sarah, Sarai, that's my sister, not my wife. And, you know, he did some things that weren't right, but God isn't looking for perfect faith in his people. He's just looking for willing hearts. Do you have a willing heart? Do you have a willing heart that says, I love the Lord, and I want to serve the Lord, and I want to, I want to walk with Jesus, I want to live for Jesus? As you spend time in God's Word, as you see Him working in your life, your faith will continue to grow. That's what happened with Abraham. His faith was not all that strong at the beginning, but by faith he continued to grow, he continued to listen to God, he continued to obey the Lord, and he continued to become more and more mature as a believer. But it didn't start off that way. Remember when God says, I'm taking you, Abraham, and your wife, Sarai, out this direction. So the first thing he did wrong was, hey, Dad, can you go with me? I don't know. I can always fall back on Dad. He's got some money in the bank. Maybe if things don't go well, I can call on Dad. And then he takes his younger nephew, Lot, with him. That didn't turn out so well. You know, Lot was very carnal, and he, you know, wanted to live in Sodom and Gomorrah and all those things. Um, it, it delayed what God was going to do for a while because instead of going to the Promised Land, they go north up into present-day Syria, and they'll hang out there for a while until his dad dies. And then once his dad dies, then they start moving towards where God wants them to be. So look at verse 4. It says, Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Haran, that's way north. And from there, when his father was dead, so it took a while, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell, again, the promised land. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. Now, this is where Abraham really began to grow in his faith. God had promised him an inheritance, both an inheritance of multitudes of descendants and an inheritance of the promised land. And as Abraham followed God, he began to realize, well, maybe not in this lifetime. And so, in Hebrews 11, that chapter on faith, we read of many of the early uh, you know, men and women of faith that they often lived in caves, they were desolate, destitute, some were killed by the sword, some were sawn in two, some were tortured. But this is what we read in Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims, on the earth. In other words, these men and women had such great faith in God and His promises that they were not looking for what they could get out of this world. Their hope was in what God had in store for them up in glory. Now, the riches of this world are nothing when compared to the infinite riches of knowing God, walking with God, knowing by faith that He's preparing a place for us in heaven that is going to be infinitely better than anything you could ever get here on earth. So, so often we get caught up and distracted by all the things of this world, and he wants us to keep our eyes on Jesus. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus reminds his uh, apostles here just before he is crucified. 
He tells them, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's our hope. He's preparing a place for us. You know, I love that song Keith Green did years ago, or not a song even. It was something he was talking about where he said, you know, God created this whole universe in six days. And can you imagine how great our place in heaven's going to be? He's been working on that for 2,000 years. He created all the universe in six days? Oh, man. And yet, he's preparing a place for us in glory. Verse 6 says, But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Now, God's telling Abraham this about 100 years before the 400 years happened. So like 500 years before the Exodus. And he says in verse 7, And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place, in the promised land. So this is the prophecy that God gave to Abraham. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, when he spoke of the 400 years they would be in bondage in Egypt. That prophecy was given right after uh, God had that conversation with Abraham, and this is when Abraham got saved. It was, it was in Re, uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. You know, first of all, Abraham says, I got no kids. You promised me descendants like the stars. And, and God says, okay, look up at the stars. If you can number them, that's how many your descendants will be. And then Genesis 15, 6, it says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. In other words, faith in the Lord has always been God's way of salvation. Paul will quote that verse. Uh, we'll see it here soon in uh, Romans chapter 4. I mean, that's the verse by which you and I have been saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith. You know, we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's the object of our faith. There's salvation in no other but Him. Verse 8, you, you know, Stephen goes on to say, Then He, the Lord, gave him, Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And so again, the Holy Spirit is bringing out the lineage of the nation of Israel here, the twelve tribes of Israel. And I can just picture, I mean, here's Stephen standing there, and you got this big group of people. They're all on these elevated stairs looking down on him. you got the 71 Sanhedrin members, the high priest is there. you got all these synagogue of the freedmen guys there accusing him and he's standing there uh face shining glowing and he's just giving them the the word of god here but as he's speaking these things i can picture all these people they're just going he's right everything he's saying is absolutely true how do we argue with that they won't get upset until a little bit later but right now they're thinking so far so good why this guy's not doing anything wrong look at verse 9 Stephen says, and the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles, gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, from verse 9 through 36, Stephen is going to focus on two main characters, two of the great men of the faith, for the Israelites. Here he talks about Joseph, and then he's going to talk about Moses. Two men who have a lot in common with Jesus. And we'll see very quickly that the first time Joseph came to his brethren, they rejected him. Second time, they received him. First time Moses comes as their deliverer, they reject him. Second time, they believed in him. Same with Jesus. First time he came, they rejected him. But they will believe him. So these two events illustrate how Israel treated Jesus Christ. They rejected him the first time. Notice what it says in John chapter 1, uh, verse 11. It says that, speaking of Jesus, he came to his own and his own received him not. They did not receive him. They said, we don't want him as our Messiah, crucify him. Second time Jesus comes, they will receive him. 
We know they're going to receive him because this is what we read in Romans chapter 11. Look at these verses starting in verse 25. Paul writes, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So Paul did not believe in replacement theology. He was not saying, oh, the Jews, they're done. God's done with them. He doesn't have anything to do with them. Now it's all about the church. No, we know that there are still Jews getting saved. He still has a plan for the Jewish people that aren't saved. At the end, when Jesus returns at the second coming, every Jew will get saved. And that's what he's going to say here. Verse 26, it says, you know, right now, there's blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And again, that will take place at the second coming of Christ. Two-thirds of the Israelites, the Jews, are going to reject him during the Great Tribulation. One-third will make it through the fire, Zechariah 13. And that one-third will put their faith and trust in Jesus. And they will go into the millennial reign of Christ in their, res in their natural bodies. But here it becomes very obvious to these religious leaders that Stephen is talking to them. Just as our forefathers and your forefathers rejected Joseph, they rejected Moses, you guys rejected Jesus. And so this is just a, an amazing sermon that see, Stephen is preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 11. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. And when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, notice, Joseph was made known to his brothers and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So again, here we see another type of Jesus in the life of Joseph. He was rejected by his own family, sold into slavery, but now they receive him the second time. And after all they did to Joseph, remember they sold him into a slave. They were jealous of Joseph. Um, Jacob had made his son a coat of many colors, and he treated Joseph very well. He was definitely showing favoritism towards his favorite son, Joseph, and the other brothers didn't like it, and so they are going to initially kill him, but then they throw him in a pit, and then they're like, ah, what are we going to do? We can't kill him. Let's sell him as a slave. They give him to the Ishmaelites. They take him down to Egypt. He becomes a slave there in Egypt. But then the Lord is with him, and you know the story. He gets raised up to become second in command over all of Egypt. The famine hits, seven years of famine, just like there'll be seven years of great tribulation. And then they will receive their brother, just as they will receive Jesus at his second coming. Anyway, God is a God of grace and mercy and love and compassion, and he wants to work these wonderful characteristics into our lives as well. And as we open up to Him, He gives us the ability to show that love, grace, mercy, compassion, forgiveness to those around us. Verse 15, So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem. Remember the cave of Machpelah? That's where they buried you know, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob will be buried there. They laid him in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise, take note of that phrase, but when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. So the time of the promise refers to that time when God was going to deliver them from their bondage in Egypt. And he would bring them into the promised land. That's what the book of Exodus is all about. That land flowing with milk and honey. So again, over 500 years have passed since God promised to Abraham what was going to happen in the future. But God's timing is always perfect. He just waited for the Israelites to multiply. And they became this huge group of people there in Egypt about the same size as Egypt. There were about 2 million Jews in Egypt, about 2 million Egyptians in Egypt, and this is why Pharaoh turns on them. He's becoming fearful. These guys might side with one of our enemies and overcome us. And so they put him into harsh slavery 
and they are brutalizing the Jewish people. And for many years, the Jews were looked upon favorably because of the way God blessed the Egyptians through Joseph. But now Joseph's long gone, and this Pharaoh, it says, rises up who didn't remember Joseph, and then he really starts putting pressure upon the Jewish people. Again, God was allowing all these things to happen because he had a better plan for the Israelites. Now look at verse 19. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. Now, we just went through the book of Exodus before we started the book of Acts, and this pharaoh of Egypt was a very evil ruler. Uh, again, the Jewish population was growing, and so he tries to control the, the Jewish population by killing all the baby boys that were born to the Jewish people. Can you imagine a civil government that would do such nasty things as kill babies? <laughs> Wait, that's our government. It, it's sad, the things we see in the world around us. Um, I've mentioned her you know, a few times over the years, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was the founder um, she became the, the founder of what became known as Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger, her whole ambition when she started her abortions, 1916 was her first abortion clinic. It was illegal, but it was to eliminate, and she says this, it was eliminate, uh, to eliminate the, she called them a different name, but the black race. That was her whole motive. She wanted to eliminate the black race. Um, she writes in an article a better race through birth control, that was the name of the article, she wrote, given birth control, the unfit, that would be the blacks, will voluntarily eliminate their kind. Amazing. And we're, we've adopted this. We're thinking this is a great thing. Oh, this is health care? <laughs> this ain't no health care. It's a death camp. In fact, Hitler sent some of his emissaries over to Margaret Sanger's people and they learned the things that she was doing and how she was getting away with things and how people were starting to support her. And he uses that for part of his final solution, which was to eliminate the Jewish race. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's exactly what he was doing way back when with this Pharaoh killing the baby boys. And so in the midst of this horrible situation, that's when Moses was born uh, his father's name was Amram, and his mother's name was Jochebed. And so we read in verse 20, At this time Moses was born, and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months, but when he was set out, you know, that was when he was put in a basket and released by his mother into the Nile River, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. Now, again, it's in Exodus 2, where it says that when Moses was born, his mother saw that he was a beautiful child. And that word beautiful means a very unique child. And so she hid him for three months. Probably after three months, you know, crying or whatever, neighbors are being alerted, oh, there's a baby boy here. And so she fears that somebody's going to grab him, throw him in the Nile River, kill him. So we read this in Hebrews 11:23. It says, "By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's commands." Again, he was no ordinary child. By faith, I think the the parents knew something great is going to happen with this ch child. Something amazing is going to happen with this kid. That's how all of us should look at our children and grandchildren. Something amazing can be done with this child, this grandchild, if they're you know, walking with the Lord, committed to the Lord. I would hope that all parents would see their children that way, not as a burden, but as a blessing, not as a problem, but they could see their potential. Here's a great verse, Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. It speaks of this. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. That's not what Planned Parenthood thinks. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. 
They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. The picture of this psalm is that as a parent, as you raise up your children in the ways of the Lord, they become arrows, they become weapons in God's hands, and they can do great things for the kingdom of God, and at the same time, they can do great things against the kingdom of darkness. That's the picture of raising up children to walk in the ways of the Lord. So we need to keep praying for our kids, keep praying for our grandchildren, uh, keep praying for the children in Sunday school, the youth group. I mean, only the Lord knows who the next Moses is, Joseph, Daniel, Elijah, Deborah, Esther, for such a time as this. You don't know. So keep praying for those children, grandchildren of ours. Look at verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So Moses, he's spared by God. It was miraculous the way when Jacobet, his mother, sends him off in the little ark. You know, it was um, Pharaoh's daughter that will rescue him. And she recognized this is one of the Hebrew kids. Her heart has changed and she will raise him. And the amazing thing is, we saw when we went through Exodus, that you know Moses' sister, Miriam, she's like six years old. She watches, she sees this, and then she runs over, hey, you need somebody to nurse this baby for you? And she's like, yeah, that's a good idea. So she gets her mom, Moses' mom, and he ends up nursing her for like the next three or four years. And so God's hand was definitely upon Moses from an early day. And as many of you know, he was raised there for 40 years in Egypt, um, basically, he was a prince under Pharaoh, and yet you can divide his life into three 40-year segments. The first 40 years, Moses thought he was something special. I mean, he's the prince of Egypt. He's got all this power, and he's got all this wealth, all this wisdom. I mean, the Egyptians were very, very smart people. But then, we'll see in a moment, you know, he has to leave. He flees out into the land of Midian. Uh, he will marry a Midianite and becomes the son-in-law of Jethro, and he will take care of Jethro's sheep for the next 40 years. So first he thinks he's something special, then he realizes he's really nothing special without the Lord as he's just out there with the sheep for 40 years. And then the last 40 years, he sees that God is very special. And God will call him from the burning bush, he will bring him back, he will become the deliverer. So anyway, look at verse 23. It says, Now when he was 40 years old, this is the first 40 years of his life, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So he knows he's Hebrew. He knows you know, that these are his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed, and he struck down the Egyptian for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. This again, the first time uh, Moses thinks, oh, I'm going to be the deliverer. I'm going to kill this Egyptian, and they're going to see I'm for them, and I'm a prince of Egypt, and so they'll do, you know, follow me. Well, he wrongly believed what he did. Um, he thought, like a lot of people think today, well, if we just get the right people in office, then our country will be great. Be careful. Our country is only as great as the people that are surrendered to Jesus. In Exodus 2, verse 12, we discover a big problem in Moses' reasoning and what he does when he goes out there and kills this Egyptian. This is what we read, Exodus 2.12. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You remember what he did wrong? He looked this way, he looked that way, he did not look up. If he would have looked up, that's where you get your instructions from the Lord. And so that's what he failed to do. He failed to call upon the Lord. He failed to recognize that God would use him to deliver the Jewish people but not in his flesh. In other words, before we try to help God, look up. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? Don't just step out in the flesh and say, I'm going to make this happen. I've done it. I think a lot of us have done it in our flesh, and it just it doesn't work out. 
So he fails miserably. And then it says in verse 26, in the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. So two Israelites. And tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. So a couple of things to note here. You know, he tries to break up these two Israelites from fighting. Oh, we saw you. You killed that Egyptian yesterday. When he hears that, he flees because when word came to Pharaoh, his stepdad, Pharaoh's like, I'm going to kill Moses. I'm just going to get him. And so that's why he fled. And he's out there for 40 years in the wilderness. Now, just as with Mo, uh, Joseph, Again, Moses was rejected by his brethren the first time, but they will be received the second time. And Stephen is going to make it very clear to these religious leaders, they rejected Jesus, their Messiah, the first time. Verse 29 here just quickly goes over the second 40-year segment of Moses' life. He will spend 40 years, it says there in Midian, and most of that time will be on the backside of the desert. Again, just taking care of sheep. Doesn't sound very prestigious, but it's exactly what God wanted him to be doing. He would become a shepherd, and he's going to learn, even as David learned, even as most pastors need to learn, God is looking for shepherds to lead his flock. It's his flock. It's not my flock. It's his flock. And yet, as an under-shepherd, we need to make sure we're not, like Peter says, lording it over others. We're to be examples to the flock. You know, God doesn't want us to be beating the sheep, but to be leading the sheep closer to Jesus. Remember when um, Jesus restored Peter? After Peter denied the Lord three times, he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you then. Feed my lambs. And he says, tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. That's the most important thing. We're never to lord it over his people. He wants shepherds that are submitted to Jesus, shepherds that are submitted to the Lord, Shepherds that have a heart to see people grow in their relationship with Christ. And so we'll stop here. Uh, just look at verse 30 real quick. We'll pick up with this verse next time, Lord willing, if we're still here. And when 40 years had passed, so it just goes from when he flees Egypt, then 40 years later, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And these next 40 years, his last 40 years, are going to be amazing because he will be serving God in his strength, not his own strength. We need to do the same. Serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the weakness of our flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this uh, powerful little uh, history lesson that Stephen is giving these religious leaders. Um, I'm convinced that they were going right along with the things he was saying, agreeing with him, but it won't be until he points out the hardness of their hearts, how they have always uh, mistreated God's servants. They, they came against the prophets who were telling them the truth from God's word. They came against the ultimate prophet that Moses said would speak even as Moses spoke, and that was Jesus, and yet they came against him. They came against Jesus. And Lord, they'll be cut to the heart. They'll be upset because we know when the truth of your word goes forth, your word is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And when we yield to the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, we're pierced with truth. We're pierced with love. We're pierced with hope. But Lord, when we reject the truth of your word, that sharp two-edged sword makes people angry and bitter, upset. And so, Lord, I pray that our hearts would always be soft to you, open to what your Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, that we would not resist the Holy Spirit, but we would yield ourselves 
to the power of the Holy Spirit, to the truth of your word, because apart from you we can do nothing. And Lord, we know that uh, your Holy Spirit will never contradict the word of God. And so we have that assurance as we spend time in your word, we're hearing the very words of God. And we can be assured that you love us and that you are with us always and that you will never leave us nor forsake us and that we are to love our wives even as you loved us, Lord. And we can't do that in our own strength and so we need your Holy Spirit working in us and through us to be the husbands you want us to be, to be the wives that you want the women to be, just to be uh, the servants of the living God as you want all of us to be. We need to yield to you and just lay aside our pride, lay aside our selfish ambitions, and just say, Lord, here I am, use me. And as we do, we we thank you, Lord, even as Stephen was used in such amazing ways, you can use us, Lord, to do above and beyond anything that we could hope or imagine, because it's all about Jesus. And so, Father, as we uh, close in this worship song, we give you all the glory. We thank you once again for being here with us, for never leaving us or forsaking us, for taking us by the hand and walking through this sin-filled world uh, with us every step of the way. Lord, may we all have your wisdom. May we make right choices throughout the day. May we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. Not just the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, but working through us for your glory. And Lord, may we just yield to you every day that you would be blessed, you would be glorified, you would increase as we decrease. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.